What year is it? Damn it. I was sleepy after lunch, so I set my alarm for half an hour. Next thing I knew, I'd been asleep for 13 months. Relatable, right? Oh well, back to the grindstone. Part 2! Once upon a time, I made a video about violence and games, and how I basically thought there was too much of it. There's a link to that video in the description below. You can watch it if you want, but it's not required viewing for this one. But there was one question about violent games that I never fully answered to my own satisfaction. Why? Why is there so much punching and stabbing and shooting and killing? There must be something about it we like. Maybe even something about it we need for us to keep coming back for more again and again. My answer to that question, the question of why, starts with a theory I have. My theory is that things that stay popular, and I mean things that stay popular for a long time, like generations, stay popular because they fulfill a collective need. That they stay popular because they relieve some unresolved tension in the society that keeps coming back to them. Violent games relieve one of the oldest tensions there is, one that goes way back. And I mean way back. All the way back to the Iliad. Part 1. The Iliad is the one about the Trojan War. You know, the one where the guy's hidden the horse? The horse part actually wasn't in the Iliad itself, which ends before that. Oh, by the way, spoilers. Instead of the horse bit, the Iliad covers a period of several weeks towards the middle of the war. The climax of the story is something like a prize fight. Brave Achilles, the best of the Greeks, versus duty-bound Hector, the best of the Trojans. Two men enter, one man leaves, and then the other man leaves, dragged behind the first man's chariot, which was kind of a dick move on Achilles' part, to be honest. What's more, there was build-up. The ancient Greek bards, much like modern pro wrestling bookers, understood that you can't just have two champs fight with no heat, no storyline. So they came up with this thing where Achilles' buddy Petroclus wore Achilles' armor, and then Hector killed Petroclus thinking he was Achilles. Anyway, the point is there was beef there, which made the big fight more dramatic. Because fights like this are dramatic, aren't they? The two top fighters squaring off for the unified Pan-Aegean Championship. The ancient Greeks were drawn to high-level competition. Remember, the Olympics were their idea. They wanted to know who the strongest was, who the fastest was, who had the most endurance. They loved sports so much that they painted them all over their pottery and houses, the Hellenic equivalent of NFL Red Zone. And a fight like Achilles vs. Hector was a display of not only strength and quickness and skill, but of commitment. To want victory so badly you'll risk life itself demands respect. And while most cultures throughout history have quite sensibly decided that they don't want to actually kill people in their sporting competitions, the appeal of that commitment is still there. Think of boxing today or mixed martial arts. A fighter who loses in a ring or cage risks more than wounded pride. There, losing might mean that you're viciously beaten and possibly knocked unconscious. This gives a champion boxer a romance that's lacking in, say, a champion tennis player. So the Greeks of Homer's time were attracted to warfare in part because it was the ultimate test of commitment. But there was a problem. The type of warfare you see in an epic poem and the type you see in real life don't look that much alike. A Greek who lived during the peak of the Iliad's popularity would have fought in what they called a phalanx. A phalanx is a military formation where everyone fights in a tightly packed line, wearing mostly the same equipment and doing mostly the same thing as everyone else. Rather than a series of dramatic one-on-one -on -one duels with high emotional stakes, real-life phalanx warfare would have mostly been just a lot of pushing and stabbing and dying. Opportunities for individual heroism were a little thin on the ground. Remember when I said that popular things stay popular because they fulfill a collective need? My personal reading of the Iliad is that it helped the Greeks reconcile the dramatic potential of life-or-death confrontation with the disappointing banality of actual warfare. Which brings us back to the present day, and part two. Modern Shootmans Today's modern military shooters aspire toward a realistic aesthetic, but they're not actually realistic. What exactly would a realistic war game look like, I wonder? I imagine it would entail taking uneventful but nonetheless highly stressful patrols every day for months before suddenly being killed by a roadside bomb. That doesn't sound like it would be a very fun game. You have to admit that warfare would be way cooler if it were more like Counter-Strike. And so, like the ancient Greeks, we create a more satisfying version. One where who lives and who dies is more down to skill and less down to either cruel fate or dumb luck. We do this to resolve a similar tension to the one resolved by the Iliad. 
So next time an 11-year-old is screaming homophobic slurs at you over a headset mic, just remember that you're doing the same thing deep-browed Homer himself used to do back in the day. You're helping to codify a different perception of war and violence, one that has more drama, more satisfaction. I don't mean this as an indictment of violent games, which I often play and enjoy myself, but I do want to highlight a troubling side effect of this process. When so much of the violence we see is artificial and designed to satisfy, it gives us a skewed perception of the real thing. Specifically, it leads to one of the most popular and hazardous habits of thought, that of believing that violence is fair. This brings us to part three. Wouldn't it be great if violence was fair? You ever watch Kung Fu? The show where the Kung Fu guy is in the Old West and goes around having adventures? He'll walk into a saloon or something, and some stupid jerk will start calling him Chinaman and just generally being a stupid jerk. And Kane will say something like, I have no wish to fight, I only want water. But the big stupid jerk will attack him anyway, and then Kane will beat him up because Kane knows Kung Fu. This sort of thing is satisfying to watch because we like to believe that fights are generally won by those who deserve to win them. That Kane was able to beat up all those stupid jerks because he deserved to win and they deserved to lose. Unfortunately, my highly unscientific study of real-world violence indicates that deserving to win a fight is not particularly well correlated with actually winning it. But when presented again and again with an escapist fantasy that reinforces the belief that violence is a tool most effectively used by the just, combined with the fact that most people believe themselves to be in the right regardless of whether or not they actually are, how could that not affect our thinking? How could that not lead us to overestimate both the righteousness and the effectiveness of violence as a problem-solving tool? I can't help but think that Americans' taste for violent escapism and America's propensity to get mired in intractable wars are related. I'm not trying to lay the corpses of the Union dead at the feet of game developers here. But I do believe that creative professions carry with them a certain level of moral responsibility. To allow this many millions of people to indulge in simulations of violence this satisfying imposes an unaccounted for cost on the world. And if you're making a violent game, there's artistic value to be found in examination of this dynamic. What might such an examination look like? It just so happens I have a very good example handy, which I'll cover in part 4. Spec Ops The Line Spec Ops The Line, the game you're looking at right now, was made by Jaeger Development and released in 2012. At first glance, it appears to be every bit the conventional modern military shooter, complete with a Middle Eastern setting and whack-a-mole cover mechanics. But then things start to get weird. I'm not going to spoil any plot points. Just know that by the end of the game, Spec Ops has become something quite rare. A military shooter that can be read as a critique of American militarism. This isn't usually the case. The big-ticket console shooters of this same style tend to cultivate a cozy relationship with the U.S. Armed Forces, and they only occasionally take American military adventurism as anything less than face value. The contrast between Spec Ops and, say, Call of Duty reminds me somewhat of what happened to Hollywood depictions of war in film. During the 50s and 60s, your average war movie was likely to be patriotic fare. Then, starting in the 70s, they frequently started to take on a subversive spirit. For the most part, no comparable shift has happened in gaming, even as the last couple of years have seen the spread of the belief that games can, and maybe even should, have political dimensions. That conversation is mostly centered around diversity, but there's no reason other industry habits couldn't be challenged as well. I'm not advocating for shooter developers at EA and Activision to be fired en masse and replaced with tie-dyed peaceniks necessarily. But I would like to see the industry's too often celebratory attitude towards war and violence balanced out by something more critical. Spec Ops The Line proved that it can be done, and done in a way that's entertaining. And I hope that other developers take it as an inspiration. Epilogue. I didn't die or anything. So by now you've probably figured out that I didn't die or anything. My apologies for being such a well-practiced and enthusiastic flake. However, I wasn't exactly doing nothing. If you only know me through YouTube, you may not know that I've also written some posts for Seamus Young's blog, 20-sided. There's a link to the blog, which I recommend, in the description. I also moved and dealt with some personal issues. But my plan now is to be back. For me, that's easier said than done, but I currently have two videos in the early pipeline, so fingers crossed. Until the next one's out, thanks for watching, stay safe out there.